welcome everybody. We have friends um, on Wollongong campus and at the other campuses at UOW. We've got friends at Canberra and we have had 270 plus colleagues register to join us virtually. Go, there's Ainsley is um, our organizer. Thank you, Ainsley, for sharing the welcome slide. Now I'm going to share my slide to commence the proceedings for our celebration for International Nurses Day. Okay, so I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. We have a beautiful artwork created by a Darawal woman for the University of Wollongong to represent the campuses that Wollongong sits on from Sydney all the way down to Bega. And I would just like to share with you my acknowledgement of country when I arrived in Wollongong and I met a friend, David Campers, and he explained to me the importance of the Illawarra um, escarpment and he explained that there's no such thing as a small backyard in Australia that is the backyard for Australia and told me about the ancestors living in the escarpment and when I was here just as a new person in Australia it really st stuck with me and helped me understand the importance of country and the wisdom that the past elders the current elders and the emerging leaders bring to us and so we always are appreciative of the wisdom they share with us and help us do a good job, particularly as nurses, as in, uh, community is so important to us on the land and the relationships we have. There we go. Just like to acknowledge the different time zones we're operating in today. We were really pleased to um, welcome presenters from different time zones, in, including Pam from the States, with a colleague in Western Australia. And many of the colleagues that registered for the webinar today are from around the world. So I thought I would just share with you the time zones. And of course, in Australia, we have a few time zones. Go. Now, I couldn't um, resist sharing a bit of myself today as well. It's actually 30 years since I was sitting my finals at the University of Edinburgh. In Edinburgh, we um, sit our finals in May, surrounded by the cherry blossom trees in the meadows. And I know Monique um, is here who absolutely loves Edinburgh. And my mum got this picture of my graduation out of the photo album. So you can see the sticky bits um, on it still. And that's a picture of me as a staff nurse at the Astley Ainsley Hospital. And in them days, it was, I was so proud that I was working in the best aged care place in Edinburgh. And now, oh my goodness, it's cringeworthy. You know, I, I was a primary nurse. It was when um, the management allocated you a group of um, clients, a group of patients, as we called them then, to be, um, you know, who you would care for. And I had six older women that I was um, cared for for the whole time I was there. And they each lived in a six bedded ward. And all they had between them was a curtain. But we did truly deliver person centered care despite all the challenges that we had in that physical environment. So that's me and my wee staffy nurse, uh, staff nurse uniform. And today I've got my University of Edinburgh nursing badge on that I would have received in July um, 1992. So I wanted to share with you my beginnings and where I've come to with the Adhere group and the team that support that and all the colleagues who undertake absolutely amazing work to contribute to the education and research we do in the Age Dementia Health Research Education Group. There we go. And our showcase piece at the minute is our gerontological nursing competencies. And here's the um, image that we had created to represent the 11 core competencies. And one of the reasons that we're um, sharing the day with University of Canberra today is that um, Kasha and I are collaborating in delivering these competencies across Australia to new graduates. And it's a piece of work that is giving us much fulfillment in our work. So excuse me a little bit of show off about me, but I wanted to um, share um, that with you. So we have um, an absolutely brilliant program today with myself as the moderator, opening from the chief nurse in ACT, and various gerontological nurses that I 100% admire and have um, such respect for because they're contributing in an amazing way to gerontological nursing. And their work is mirrored by so many other gerontological nurses that I really wanted to showcase that today for International Nurses Day, particularly in light of what the 
gerontological nurses have been going through through the COVID pandemic and they're still going through. Now I have to do the housekeeping bits before Ainsley, um, before I forget. So we have, um, for those of you online, we have a Q&A function because it's a webinar. So if you would like to use the Q&A function to submit any questions that you have, any comments that you'd like to submit, and we have um, colleagues who will be monitoring that for us. And I'll, I'll have a quick look as well. And um, we also appreciate those of you who are in Australia, please um, put into the chat which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country you're meeting on today, where you're zooming in from. We like to see the diversity of our friends and, and where they're located. Now, I will just check with Ainsley if she would like me to say anything else before I hand over to Tony. Um, just a reminder, um, yeah, to put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat, that would be amazing. That'll just help us um, make sure that we respond to as many questions as we can. That's lovely. Thanks, Thanks Victoria. Thank you. So I've got great delight to introduce Tony Domkins from the ACT of Chief Nurse um, for us. So I'll just read his bio. Tony was appointed to the chief nurse role for nursing and midwifery in January 2020. He's the director of nursing and he was the director of nursing and midwifery, Northern Sydney Health District. He graduated as a registered nurse in 1987, only a short while before myself, and holds postgraduate clinical certificates in renal and transplantation nursing and intensive care nursing, as well as a master's in health management. Anthony has held a variety of senior health management positions within the public and private health sectors across New South Wales. In June 2014, Anthony Dobkins was appointed as an adjunct to press professor for nursing with the University of Sydney and the Australian Catholic University. Anthony was a member of the Clinical Excellence Commission Advisory Board and a board director for Stuart House. So please join me in welcoming Tony. Can you hear me? Excellent. I'm Anthony Domkins and I'm the ACT Health Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer. And it is an honor and I thank you for the invitation to provide the opening address pertaining to gerontological nursing, transforming aged care. What a well attended forum to discuss this wonderful specialty to support our most vulnerable in, in the community. Gerontological nursing is defined as the specialty of nursing pertaining to older adults. Gerontological nurses work with, with older adults, their families and communities to support healthy aging, maximize functioning and maintain quality of life. Gerontology is concerned with the physical, mental and social aspects and implementation of aging versus geriatrics as a medical specialty focused on care and treatment of older persons. Gerontological nursing is important to meet health needs of an aging population due to the the longer life expectancy and declining facility rates. The proportion of the population that is considered old is increasing. The five characteristics of Gerontological nurses possess an understanding of the aging process, patience and empathy, a commitment to understand nonverbal communication, compassion, communication and connection, and stress management. In many cases, helping solve the problems of a fragmented and impersonal healthcare is what ultimately inspires a career to care for the elderly. Another characteristic that attracts people to the aged care sector is its commitment to looking beyond health symptoms to promote high quality person-centred care. However, the complexity of the elderly patient defers both nurses and students from choosing this specialty. Exposure by means of clinical placements and specific education potentially can increase interest. The lack of status and the financial aspects also have a negative influence of interest. 
What can we do to demystify the perceptions of genealogical nursing? We need to promote the beauty and wisdom of this specialty and rebrand genitological nursing as a career and the aged care sector as an employer of choice. Genitological nursing needs to be promoted as a specialty in its own right, where it relates to a particular knowledge and skill set, working closely with individuals and families to navigate multiple comorbidities, medication and treatment interactions, health services, we, while maintaining personal preference and autonomy. We need to highlight older persons. Nursing happens across the spectrum of health, acute care, community, rehabilitation, residential and home care. More than 50% of hospital bed days are utilised by people over the age of 65. So many nurses are predominantly looking after older people, but do not appreciate the necessity to build the skills and knowledge in that area, with a particular focus on the assessment and support for people with cognitive impairment, including dementia and delirium. Health services need to ensure within the academic clinical arena, clinical placements are encouraged not only in the first year, but vital in the final years of academic nursing studies. A transition to practice program in conjunction with the acute sector is vital to create awareness of this clinical specialty. The transition to practice program of the geriatrological nursing competencies with the University of Wollongong and the University of Canberra is a solid demonstration of the increasing support of this pathway. Acknowledgement of the geriatrological nurse within the awards recognition ceremony is also required. The ACT COPE Award, Caring for Older Persons, excellent award for an undergraduate nursing student is another strategy to promote this vital nursing specialty. At a recent ACT Age Care Nursing Roundtable, the following was identified with strategies developed to address the same. Older persons nursing specialty requires recognition and promotion within curriculum. We need to develop a community of practice for older persons complex nursing. We need to apply a multi-pronged strategy to integrate acute community aged care with an interface that promotes a real a relational care and a better understanding to manage the complex patients and their options to transition back into the community. And we determined that we needed to create a shared statement that identifies a shared vision and the purpose and community awareness to support and enable and promote and maintain the safety and well-being of older people in our community. It is vital aged care workers need to be registered with their authority to practice and in Australia, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency. Complex older person nursing is the preferred terminology to recognise the important and growing specialty of nursing, which includes skills, knowledge and attitudes specific to caring for the older person. We need to re-engineer the aged care workforce needs, RN staffing after hours 24 seven, pay equity with aligned to the acute sector. And we need to develop the full scope of practice for AINs, ENs, RNs in the aged care clinical arena. I have been blessed to secure an academic position within my portfolio to focus on aged care nursing in collaboration with the University of Canberra. Evidence-based practice and research is vital to highlight geriatrological nursing. The role will also explore the importance of information systems to connect the aged care sector and support nursing care. The aged care sector has had an enormous challenge during the COVID-19 pandemic, of which I was fortunate to work alongside the local residential aged care facilities in relation to policy formation. What I witnessed was an unbelievable dedication to high quality care with the determination, resilience and tenacity of the nursing personnel to support their aged care clients. I acknowledge the efforts to bring this forum to fruition.
and thank you again for the opportunity to address this vital area of need from a professional and clinical perspective. I wish you all a happy International Nurses Day. Thank you. That's fabulous. Thank you, Tony. What a way to start the meeting, the get together. So thank you. Now I'm going to um, ask, um, just check the Q&A to see, we haven't got a Q&A. So I'm going to ask the colleagues at Wollongong if you have a question for Tony that you would like to ask. Look at this, other people. Yes, Anita, thank you. Yeah, hi, thanks for that presentation, Tony. Um, I'm just wondering, one of the things that we, in my work, I find that there's a limited um, engagement of nursing within the policy context. And uh, we find it's very hard to get, um, well, within the public sector in particular, public service, getting um, bureaucrats aware of the complexity of the work that nurses do and also the complexity of needs of older people. It's really hard, it's really hard to get them to, to fathom that. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about um, or strategies that you might use that might help us um, to make that influence the um, public policy arena. Oh, that's a, I think that's a very solid question. Uh, I think there is the potential disconnect because age, uh, while I think all government is committed to uh, enhancing the um, ex experience and outcome for the aged care, there is that potential disconnect because aged care is driven through the Commonwealth and services are provided at a state and territory level. So I, I, I do believe that an inordinate amount of policy reform will occur due to the unforeseen uh, Royal Commission into aged care. And I, and I do believe that is, it will be a major focus of the Commonwealth and it will be driven from the Commonwealth Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer. Um, well, but within my local ACT territory, my role is policy formation. And we, and clinical operations sits with um, Canberra Health Services. So working with um, uh, Cassia as a, and developing Aged Care Roundtable, as well as a forum that we're holding in relation to aged care on Monday, will be the foundation for um, 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 policy change, hopefully across the ACT. Uh, I, am, I do believe that having uh, nursing aged care nursing through the lens of acad through an academic title also provides some gravitas of the importance of aged care through uh, collaboration with health and industry. But I, I do believe we, we need to be together at a Commonwealth and state level to develop policy pertaining to aged care nursing as well as standards of, of, of care. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Anita, is that, do, would you like to respond to Tony's um, answer to your question? Yes, well, just, I think that's a, that's, it's great that we've got people like yourself in, in this role, Tony. Um, we had a, a, the Australian Association of Gerontology had a, had a webinar last night on how gerontologists can interact and impact on policy. And, and the, the view was um, nationally that it's really hard to make those those connections and commitments, and I and I think you're right. I think talking with the chief nursing officer or talking with uh, using those uh, linkages that we have yeah. as external external players in the in the field, linking in with those people and trying to affect change through some of those um, our uh, professional organisations yeah. are really the critical tools. I, I totally agree, and um, I I will reach out to Cassia and in and um, ascertain where those um, trailblazers champions are, are within this field and provide the opportunity to speak 
to um, the uh, chief nursing and midwifery officers across the nation that we meet um, every quarter. And when they are in ACT, then um, I, I develop the agenda and, um, and we can make sure that you're at the table to discuss those um, um, what is what is so important um, to support our aged care and at times are most, are most vulnerable. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you, Tony. I think you've provided some inspiration and uh, hope for the future with colleagues like yourselves advocating for gerontological nursing at that high level. So just join me in thanking Tony. Thank you. Thank you. That's brilliant. And I, um, we don't have any more time um, to ask Tony any further questions. But please put your questions in the Q and A because I believe we'll have some time towards the end. Thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move on to be in the United States um, with Pamela Jane Rye Nye, who is a very important donor to the School of Nursing. Pamela has donated funding for a scholarship for a postgraduate nurse. Um, who is also working while they're studying. And at the end of today, we're going to be announcing the winner of that scholarship. Um, and the vice chancellor will be coming later to do the closing address and she's going to be awarding the scholarship. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Pamela to um, share in the celebration of International Nurses Day. Now, so Tony, if you can put yourself on mute. And then I believe if Pamela starts talking, she will become the presenter in the webinar. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you, Pamela. No, I didn't can't. That's always a very good sign. I can't tell you how honored I am to be here, to be able to speak to all of you and tell you about the Pamela Jane Nye Working Nurse Scholarship. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I put together a few slides so I could uh, acquaint you with, let's see here, there we go. <clears throat> acquaint you with me and with the scholarship. Um, the University of Wollongong, this is, a, this is a, a new scholarship for you. So I wanted to take a few moments to introduce myself and let you get to know me a bit. Um, I am happy to be able to, uh, to be the grantor of this scholarship. And let's see, I think if I put this on. Ah, now you can see the entire screen, right? <clears throat> okay, having said that, when I was a young nurse many years ago, uh, I always said to myself, if I ever made it in life, if I ever got to a point where I could give back because I'd been given so many gifts and blessings that I would take that opportunity and give back. I started um, my graduate work at the University of California in San Francisco. I don't know if we have any Americans in the audience. I may be the only one. But UCSF in San Francisco is a wonderful university uh, devoted to much research and, um, and a lot of research that's come out uh, on gerontological nursing. Um, with financial concerns, I started my graduate work and wondered if I was going to be able to actually stay in school. And I'm sure those students who are here with us today are thinking about the same thing. And I made myself a promise because of the traineeship that I was awarded in my very first semester of school, I probably was going to be able to make it through school and I did. I graduated and I graduated with honors. I made my mark in the area of neuroscience nursing and I became educated as a clinical nurse specialist. 
A clinical nurse specialist is a master's or doctorally prepared nurse in a specialty area that works in three spheres of nursing with the community, with the individual, and with the nurse. <clears throat> the Pamela Jane Scholarship is awarded to working nurses who are trying to juggle school as well as working. And that sometimes is a tall order. And many of you are, are doing this every day. And I, I know what kind of a burden it can be. And I honor you. Happy, nurse, happy International Nurses Day to all of you. And you deserve incredible praise for the work that you do, which has become increasingly difficult in these days of the pandemic. Um, this prestigious scholarship is uh, presented for the first time to the University of Wollongong. And it is um, indicative of a nurse who has shown leadership, science, and professionalism in, in her, his or her art. So who am I? Well, I am a clinical nurse specialist. I started out as a clinical nurse specialist at UCSF, the University of California, San Francisco where I then left after approximately 10 years and joined Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, following my, my uh, time at uh, Cedar sinai I was given an opportunity to work in research and loved it. Really felt like I had found my home. I was working in a phase three clinical trial. At the time, it was called Fast Mag. Fast Field Administration Stroke Therapy with Magnesium. We were trying to determine if giving magnesium IV in the ambulance within two hours of stroke symptom onset would make a difference at 90 days and therefore a lifetime. The trial itself did not show magnesium to be a neuroprotectant, but what it did show was a remarkable ability to have a study design that in the United States was groundbreaking. Up until that time, we had not given um, intravenous medications to patients in the, in what we called it the rig, in the ambulance, as the patient was transported to the hospital. So this groundbreaking study, the FAST MAG clinical trial became a sort of um, basis for reaching out and giving uh, intravenous medications to, to save the brain. I am uh, an associate professor in the School of Nursing at UCLA. I was also an associate professor to the School of Nursing at UCSF when I was there. I'm also an entrepreneurial nurse and I own two businesses. I am one of the pioneers in the United States right now about uh, entrepreneurial nursing for nurses. In the United States, this is uh, very new. I am in the process of partnering with the American Nurses Association uh, to provide novice entrepreneurs education and guidance in the area of business ownership. I am who I am today because I received a traineeship. And I always said that if I got the traineeship, if I graduated and finished my, my, uh, my education, that I would give back. And so today I'm giving back to 12 hospitals, universities, and organizations. And you can see them listed there. And I put the University of Wollongong right at the top because that's the newest one. The, uh, this, this scholarship has not been awarded to a nurse at the University of Wollongong prior to today. So today will be the first of, of many. Uh, you can see I also have included UCSF, UCLA, University of Iowa, Martin Luther King Hospital. In the way of organizations, the National Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists, where I recently gave a talk uh, this is at the national conference. The name of my talk was The Rise of the Nurse Entrepreneur. Uh, the National League of Nursing has accepted uh, um, 
money I've granted toward a scholarship, as well as the Association of California Nurse Leaders. Uh, Greater Los Angeles Veterans Hospital Nurses receive a scholarship as well, and one that will be um, provided this year in 2022 is with the American Nurses Association. In my business, I provide free or cost, low cost education for nurses who need to renew their licenses through continuing education. And I am a volunteer and a mentor to the American Heart Association where I uh, am mentoring young women in the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math. And I have recently been mentoring a young, young lady uh, she's 16 years old, and her ultimate goal is to become a neurologist, and I'm quite sure she's going to meet that goal. She's incredibly bright. And this is what I've done to honor nurses. Um, Operation Scrubs is a nonprofit organization, and I periodically, about every other year, um, acquire a yacht. You can see it in the middle, upper middle uh, picture where I take nurses from all over the greater Los Angeles area and honor their work. We usually have education and then we have dining and dancing the night away on a, a, a harbor cruise. It's been an incredibly good life for me and I'm going to continue to share it with all of you. I'm so incredibly grateful to be able to honor a nurse from the University of Wollongong who will be announced later on, I understand, uh, with this very prestigious scholarship. Thank you so much. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs> I see clapping hands. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you, Pamela. That was just wonderful. And you're certainly putting Wollongong University on the map um, alongside all those other prestigious organizations and universities. And please um, extend um, invitations to all, to all your colleagues to come and visit us. And, and I hope you make it here one day, Pamela. I definitely want to be there one day as well. We're going to get on top of this pandemic and then I'll, I'll be traveling more. Oh, that's excellent, Pamela. Now, I'm just going to, we've got some questions in the Q&A, so I'll just, um, okay, I'm not sure these ones um, are for yourself, Pamela, so I'm just going to open it up to the Zoom visitors and anyone in the audience who has a question for you, Pamela. Yep, we've got someone from the back there. Ezene, please ask your question. Um, yeah, my question, oh, well, first of all, thank you, Pamela, for all everything you do for all your philanthropic um, work. My pleasure. But my question is, um, how did the University of Wollongong get your lucky? <laughs> <laughs> Good question, Ezene. Okay, I couldn't quite hear it. Would you repeat it, please? Oh, okay, I was just asking, how did the University of Wollongong School of Nursing get so lucky? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, um, your, um, your professor and vice chancellor, uh, Patricia uh, Davidson and I had been sort of distant uh, acquaintances. And this tells you the power of social media. She and I met first on LinkedIn and continued to, uh, to talk back and forth through LinkedIn. Um, I'm a, a big presence there, and I encourage you to follow me. I'm uh, a great proponent of nurses, and I believe very strongly that in the coming years, we are going to be leading a major change in healthcare. The world as we know it is changing. Maybe for the better, I hope so, but I think nurses are going to lead the challenge that lies ahead. So God bless all of you who are young and energetic and get out there and lead the way. Oh, thank you, Pamela. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Pamela, your presentation just now is exactly what International Nurses Day is all about. So thank you so much. And I, I haven't dared to ask what time it is with yourself. <laughs> 
It, here in Los Angeles, it's 10 after nine in the evening. Okay, so, so and I believe that you're going to um, be staying with us until you get the opportunity to virtually award the scholarship to this successful um, applicant. Yes, I'll be staying awake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. Now, just before um, I introduce you to the next speaker, I did like to just share with you that um, on the Zoom, we've had, um, you know, everybody's been submitting their, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country on which they meet today. But of course, I'm the only one getting the pleasure of seeing how wide that is. But we've also had messages from our friends at Taipei Medical University and the Dean of the, the faculty there has said hello. And some for myself, many uh, longtime friends in aged care. So I'm uh, appreciating all the hellos from around the, the, the tracks. And there was a hello from Western Australia from Edith Cowan University. And that's where we're going next. So our next um, presenter is Dr. Marcus Ang. And he is a lecturer in Edith Cowan University. And I'll just um, read his uh, bio for us. So Marcus is a nursing lecturer at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia and a nurse researcher at Hollywood Private Hospital. He graduated from the National University of Singapore with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing Honours in 2012 and was awarded his Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Newcastle in 2020. Marcus is passionate about the research of older people and their family carers, especially in the areas, area of falls, and is involved in several collaborative projects between Edith Cowan University and Hollywood. Marcus is also an active member of the Australian Association of Gerontology, Community Falls Network, Network and Injury Matters, and the Centre for Research in Aged Care at Edith Cowan University. So please welcome Marcus. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, um, my name is Marcus and thanks Vicky for your introduction. Um, before I start, I would like to um, acknowledge the Noongar people who are the traditional custodian of the land upon which I'm based in. So I'm currently um, based in Western Australia and I'm from ECU. So I would also like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy International Nurses Day and also to thank Professor Victoria for inviting me to this event. So in this presentation, um, I have been invited to briefly share about my nursing journey and how I managed to create a unique career pathway for myself as a nurse researcher and also um, Although, although my career pathway is not entirely related to gerontology nursing, I hope that my presentation could inspire the nurses um, to develop their unique career pathway within gerontology. So a little bit of, about myself. So, I'm a nursing lecturer from ECU, as you have known. And I'm also a nurse researcher at Hollywood Private Hospital. So unlike the traditional career path of an academic, I spend half of my time teaching at the university and the other half doing research in the hospital. So my research area mainly focus on exploring the perceptions of false, false risks among older people and their family carers and nurses. And as a nurse researcher, I'm also involved in supporting a number of research um, in the hospital, such as um, having a nurse-led volunteer support, exploring AI in pain assessment, um, and conducting research training for nurses in the clinical to engage in research activities. So in the next few slides, I will briefly share with you about myself and how I managed to come to where I am with a dual position in the academic um, sector. So as like most people, um, I began my career as an RN in a large tertiary hospital in Singapore. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing with an honours in 2012. So this year is incidentally my 10 year in nursing. Um, 
And before I continue, um, I guess many, many people would ask me, why do you choose nursing in the first place? So for me, um, I chose nursing because I wanted to teach. So over the past 10 years, I've been working towards trying to accumulate a variety of different nursing experience so that I could share my experience with my students. So on the left hand side of my, uh, this slide, you could see uh, that was actually my very first day of uh, nursing uh, during orientation week. So technically I was uh, in my honeymoon period <laughs> when I started nursing. So I was first posted to a medical ward under the discipline of neurology, where I look after people with dementia, Parkinson's disease, and um, stroke. You can say that that's the time when I fall in love with the discipline of gerontology. So at the medical ward, I learned to plan discharges for my patient, arrange for step-down care depending on their needs. And um, because not every patient from the um, medical ward get discharged home. And after a year and a half, I realized um, I need to advance my nursing skills further. So I requested for a rotation to the neuroscience intensive care unit uh, within the hospital. And this is where I get to see even more um, patients uh, with different types of uh, neurological condition, uh, especially post-op patients, patients suffering from head trauma, such as falls, uh, suffering from hemorrhagic stroke, et cetera. So after about um, two years into my role, I felt that nursing seems to become rather routine for me, especially after I passed the initial transition stage. So at that time, um, besides uh, working my usual shift in the hospital, I was also working very closely with my honor supervisor at a personal level to publish my work. So um, although it was hard work to go back to school on a regular basis after uh, eight hours or 10 hours of shift work, I enjoy every moment of it. And from then, I also realized that research um, seems to be the only way that could keep me energized because I get to learn new things every now and then. So I began um, negotiating with the management of a hospital and, um, and I was pretty lucky in the sense that I was given the opportunity to take on a dual position a uh, dual role working in the ICU and a nurse researcher at the hospital. So I work 0.4 in the ICU as a nurse and also uh, 0.6 as a nurse researcher in the hospital. That's when I actually uh, embarked into the area of research. Um, while negotiating, obviously um, I have to put out a proposal to say that why I, am, I deserve this dual position. And at that time, the hospital was trying to promote um, nursing research uh, and because it's a teaching hospital. So I try to support myself by saying that uh, I have an honors degree and uh, I have a bit of a research experience in publication. So my hard work with working with my supervisor actually paid off um, with that. So after a few years, as a, a, about a year plus as a nurse researcher, um, I decided that it's actually time for me to further my studies because I, I know that I need to get a PhD in order to fulfill my research ambition and teaching ex, uh, ambition. So at the time, um, I was deciding between uh, whether should I complete my PhD in Singapore or Australia, but I decided to choose the latter because it, was, it is also my dream to actually study overseas. So I decided to take a leap of faith to apply for a scholarship at Newcastle and I was successful. So as you can see from my pictures, um, Newcastle is a beautiful city. Um, it's north of Wollongong and um, there are great beaches and snakes as well. Um, it was pretty surprising for me because in Singapore, you, you don't see snakes uh, that often. <laughs> So just uh, a bit more, a few more pictures about Newcastle. So Newcastle has a beautiful campus uh, where I met many um, nice people whom I still keep in contact with. Uh, that is also one of my goal, uh, reason why I decided to move overseas to study. And during my PhD, um, I decided to continue with my research in false prevention. 
And, but this time I decided to conduct my research within the community in Newcastle because I wanted to understand more about the local healthcare system and culture. Um, I conducted my research in uh, multiple sites such as a day rehab center, outpatient clinic, research institute, non-volunteering organization, such that it gave me a good overview of what's, uh, what are the services available in the community. So after my PhD, um, I began my very um, first academic position at ECU, Edith Cohen University in WA. So um, just a few pictures about myself um, teaching. So on the left hand side is actually uh, a photo of uh, my, after I finished uh, my year one orientation lecture with my year one students. And on the right is actually my, my very first batch of uh, master students uh, who decided to spring uh, celebration uh, after their 13 weeks of tutorial. So what's next um, after 10 years of uh, trying to get to where I am now? So over the past 10 years, uh, you can see I made several important decisions that leads to where I am. Um, I have never regret choosing nursing. I believe um, nursing is the profession that allows me to travel and practice internationally. I also hope that um, I could actually share my international experience with my students in the coming years. So before I leave you with, um, I came across this quote uh, in Adelaide's airport, uh, which I find it really meaningful. It says that when everything seems to go against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind and not with it. So while it's challenging to forge a career path that is not recorded on paper, um, I believe that it is possible to create a unique career path for yourself um, if you plan. So always keep talking to different people and uh, try to know people. And that's when opportunities will come across, uh, come about. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Marcus, for sharing your journey and uh, sharing some words of wisdom for the uh, younger colleagues out there. Thank you, Marcus. That's Thank awesome. you. Okay, now I'm going to see if we've got some questions for you in the chat. So the last question, um, I think it would be for you, Marcus. Ma um, Marianne is asking about other joint academic lecturing positions. And perhaps maybe you'd be able to share with how, how your one was created, because I think they're not as common as we would like them to be. Um, yes. Um, so I actually got this joint position last year. Um, after one year in the as an academic, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I talked to many people. I get to know different people. So one of my colleague, uh, a senior colleague of mine at ECU, she is... Um, research fellow at Hollywood Private Hospital because she got a major grant. So she has very good connection with the um, director of clinical service in the hospital. And incidentally, um, the director of clinical service mentioned that the hospital has uh, set aside a small fund to hire a nurse researcher. And it just happened that um, a part-time nurse researcher, and it just happened that um, I have worked as a nurse researcher back in Singapore as a dual position. So um, I applied and I got it. Um, and at the time it was pretty challenging because I had to negotiate with um, the head of school of ECU. So I was wondering whether do I have to uh, leave ECU or do I have to, whether can I stay on as an academic? So what the head of school suggested was uh, it could, that, that position as a nurse researcher could be converted into a partnership um, uh, grant and it becomes uh, absorbed into ECU and I could actually get seconded for 50% in the hospital. So somehow a lot of discussion going on and uh, with support from the, the key people within my school and in the hospital and they created such a dual position. So many people would think that this is just uh, by luck but I believe that it still takes uh, quite a bit of a planning and uh, you have to talk to different people and you try your try your hands on different things because you never know that it could evolve the position could evolve into something that you didn't expect so when I applied for the nurse research position I didn't expect that 
it will become seconded into my dual position as an academic. Yeah. So Marcus, it sounds to me as you as if you're combining the messages from Tony about being strategic and using your networks, but also the entrepreneurial um, role of nurses that Pamela mentioned as well. So that was a nice follow on from there. And I think that's what we need to be thinking about all these different aspects of our personality that brings us to nursing and then the skills we develop along the way. So just join me in thanking Marcus again, Thank please. You. Thank you. Now we're moving across to Canberra and um, Kasha is at home because of the COVID isolation uh, problem. Um, and unfortunately the next um, speaker was unable to uh, join us today because she's um, unwell, but lucky she has done lots of uh, videos of previous presentations and talking about uh, gerontological nursing. So Macy, who's in the room at Canberra is going to share a video that um, has been created so that Nikki can be with, uh, with us today. So I'm just gonna read Nikki's bio out as well. I might see, we might need a light at the back of the room there as well, is it, is, or is it okay? It's okay, okay, thank you. So Net Nikki Johnson is a lecturer in nursing, palliative, uh, also a palliative care nurse practitioner at the University of Canberra. Nikki believes all Australians deserve access to quality care nearing the end of life, regardless of their age, diagnosis, or where they live. Her research team tested a model integrating specialist palliative care into residential aged care. They were recognized nationally for their approach that led to reduced avoidable hospital transfers, normalized dying while increasing the capacity of staff to care for older people in their last months of life. Nikki represents nursing on the ACT Clinical Leadership Forum and was an expert witness for the Aged Care Royal Commission in Quality and Safety. Nikki is a PhD student researching relieving trauma at the end of life. A palliative care nurse practitioner with 30 years of clinical practice currently working for the University of Canberra. Nikki received an Order of Australian Medal for, con for her contribution to nursing and was the inaugural winner of the Australian College of Nursing Federal Health Minister's Trailblazer Award for Innovation in Nursing. So please join me in welcoming Nikki. And please send some good vibes across to Canberra University. My name is Nikki Johnston. I'm a um, palliative care nurse practitioner and have been for the last 11 years. I've been working in Canberra for the last 20 years. And um, prior to being a nurse practitioner, I was a specialist palliative care nurse. I'm currently also working at the University of Canberra teaching nursing. Palliative care firstly is about living, um, living as well as we can, and then dying well as well. So um, it's about improving quality of life for people who have um, life limiting illness and this also includes the frail aged um, some people die just because they're old um, palliative care is a definite um, human right um, everyone deserves the right to have access to palliative care and it's not it's not overly understood as to what the benefits are um, palliative care can support people living with life limiting illness, but also the families. And when, when people are confronted with life limiting illness or disease processes, or even if they're just getting very old, they do need specialist care at some point. And at other times they need the care of their general practitioner. I'm a palliative care nurse practitioner and my job at present is integrating specialist palliative care into residential aged care. Because of the fact that we've got such an ageing population nowadays and we're having more and more people come into nursing homes, they're coming in later and later in life with more chronic illnesses. Palliative care is not only just there for end of life, they're there prior to that end of life to make sure that they're comfortable. 
Part of our model is running palliative care needs rounds and that's a monthly education session. We teach the staff to identify residents who are at the greatest risk of dying and that without a plan in place. The palliative care needs rounds enable us to really novelly and creatively find out what these needs are and respond to them in a way which is light touch but high impact. A lot of people in residential aged care didn't really understand that they'd be caring for people at end of life, so uh, we wanted to normalise that and give them the skills and knowledge they need to talk to people in the last months of life, to also help them with pain and other symptoms that can be distressing. Part of the palliative care needs rounds is teaching the staff about the law around decision making, so whether that's decisions that are made by a person who's able to do that for themselves or decisions that are made by an enduring power of attorney or a guardian. It's a great honour to be a finalist for the Trailblazer Nursing Award and quite frankly I, I feel very humble as so many nurses do so much good work. The best thing about this award though is that this is going to help um, people who are dying, people who are needing end of life care, palliative care it's going to help us to get some traction to move this, our project, throughout Australia so that older, vulnerable people will have a voice. All of the people that I work with in residential aged care facilities, what a fantastic group, what a fantastic workforce out there that is so undervalued. They work so hard. And, um, you know, I really want to lift them up with me tonight because, um, they really deserve that. I am really driven, and I have been my whole nursing career, to look at people who are underprivileged, who are vulnerable, who don't fit into our cure-driven, cure-valued health system. If you are not someone who can be cured, if you are someone who's managing chronic illness or you're dying from illness or dying because you are old, you feel really let down by what's on offer. I can't thank you enough, everyone. And thank you. And we also realised that there's a whole workforce out there that haven't been taught how to care for people at end of life. Um, they're fantastic people who really care. None of us know how to do this unless we're taught. So that's part of our integration model. We ca we've come together, specialist palliative care has come together with residential aged care. There's 28 facilities in Canberra. Um, together we can do this work well. Where I work, I'm, I'm a palliative care nurse practitioner at the highest level of nursing possible clinically in Australia. I work with carers, cooks, cleaners, um, registered nurses, enrolled nurses, assistants in nursing, managers of facilities that have no care background at all. All of us are important. We just do different jobs. So every single one of us is needed. Let's break down the hierarchy. Everyone is important if we're going to provide the best end of life care for these older people. It, it's a massive honour. Um, to, to be honest, it's not easy to accept a, an award like this. Um, I've worked with amazing people throughout my career. I've had really good mentors. And um, it, yeah, it, it's not easy to sort of separate yourself and think, why am I any different to anyone else? We're all doing a good job. Ever since I was a little girl, I used to have, I used to care for animals. I used to take animals off the street. <laughs> um, now I, I really have a passion for people who are vulnerable, people who don't have an advocate, people who don't fit in to our system of healthcare. Um, there's lots of people that don't fit. Uh, our healthcare system and our community values cure. A lot of people are never going to be cured. They live and they manage their disease. Others die from their disease. Others die because they're old and frail. They don't even have a disease. So let's not medicalise all of this as much. 
and care for where the person is. Let's meet them where they are and respect them for who they are. And nursing gives me the ability to advocate for people um, and speak up, give a voice to those that can no longer speak for themselves. Um, nursing gives me so many opportunities to, to do that. King and Nikki, and I know. And um, Kasha and Macy, please um, express our thanks to Nikki. I'm so happy that you were able to share that video with us. And um, I'm sure everybody else is feeling we've got a sense that um, Nikki's here today um, celebrating International Nurses Day and being a trailblazer for us. So thank you for that. That's good. Now, um, just going to check. Um, I think that one of our um, panelists has been unable to join us today. So um, we've actually got some time for some more questions. So I'll hand it to the room. Anyone in Wollongong got any questions for any of the panelists? And I think that Kasha and Macy will be able to take questions for Nikki as well. Anita? Uh, um, I guess just that last presentation was really interesting because um, the Commonwealth Government has recently um, provided $9 million for us um, to implement. Oh, so I work for the Australian Health Services Research Institute, the um, Innovation Campus. And we're doing a, uh, we've got a national program that's actually rolling out the use of palliative care outcome measures in residential aged care. And we benchmark, and we use a process of improvement facilitated and benchmarking outcomes as a way to lift quality and lift um, outcomes for people who are um, dying in um, or receiving palliative care in aged care services nationally. But just in, the, in that last presentation, I thought there's really, there are a number of opportunities for research that could actually build on the data that's been um, captured under both the that pay block program, the palliative aged care outcomes program, but also with the um, impending um, take up of the ANAC, which is the Australian National Aged Care Classification System, which is the new funding model for residential care. That also will provide an opportunity for uh, research into um, comparing ANAC passes across facilities. So if a person's in a, um, I don't know if you know about ANAC, but there's 16 classes of um, need, but we'll be able to compare residents like versus like, and again benchmark, and again um, unpack why some facilities might not be able to improve uh, deliver the same outcomes for that similar class of uh, resident that, that others are. So I guess um, there are a number of really structural developments that are occurring that Commonwealth's invested in, that it's, um, there are real opportunities for us to use that research and to build um, you know, opportunities across the university um, just mm. to sort of unpack and um, I guess drive improvements within aged care in particular. So for our friends on Zoom, our colleague Anita was just highlighting some of the data that's already collected um, by university institutes and government initiatives that um, might bring hope for um, pro research projects that might previously have not been possible. Mm -hmm. And now with the data sets, it might be uh, more straightforward to do some implementation research between um, uh, colleagues working in practice in industry. Yeah, so Anita, we definitely need to get together, banging on the door of the vice chancellor, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the partnership grants. <laughs> yes, Kasha? Yeah, if I can just jump in and, and talk to those points too, and thanks so much, Anita. I think they're really valuable to talk about. I think the other side of it that Nikki, I'm sure, would talk to as well was the, the level of kind of groundswell that you need to get those projects happening and implementing. And, and I know you know as well, Anita, that um, 
And Nikki, as, as a personality and, and that ability to be entrepreneurial and to keep knocking on doors to ask for the assistance that's needed to meet the needs of the clients on the ground is, is just so huge. One of the reasons why I always like hearing Nikki talk is I think she's such a uh, a vision of, of that kind of quotation about leadership, about that, that leadership is seeing a gap and then finding a way to fill it and, and filling it, finding a way to do so. And, and she's always, you know, found a tribe to go with her and then taken that tribe with her. And in that case, it was both about the research project, about evaluating and demonstrating the cost savings for, for the government and for hospital admissions, as well as actually making sure to get enough people on the ground to support the program and, and to be able to deliver it, because you can see about them kind of multiple players that are involved and I know that everybody in the audience that there's often so many logistical challenges and, and whether it's just about having an assessment and service but you also need to be able to have access to opiates after hours or whatever is the particular challenge for that setting that having those people those clinicians on the ground who are seeing that and then finding the ways to, to fund that and get the people to support them I'm hoping uh, that, that those pieces can, can be seen throughout these presentations about people getting the confidence to line up what they need in their own areas as well and making the most of what the Commonwealth is, is changing. Yeah, thank you, Kasia. Now, Kasia, we had, um, we had a comment in the <coughs> chat from one of our Zoom friends um, mentioning that, you know, we really do need a gerontological nursing association and it's something that's missing in Australia. Do you, do you have any thoughts about that, Kasia? Look, I think that that's absolutely something, it's a, a conclusion that we keep coming to. Um, and Vicky and I have had conversations about this and I've had conversations with others in, in the panel. Um, and I really think that's uh, something we can work towards and anyone who's interested, I think, please sing out to us because we're you know, trying to come up with a solution in that frame. We do have a lot of professional bodies um, and they do fantastic work and we need to con keep contributing to them. Um, but uniquely one that is just for, for older person nursing is lacking. Um, and I think that's the thing to take from today too, being International Nurses Day and about talking about a voice to lead, to remember that, you know, if you're wanting to have a palliative care needs rounds in your area, who do you need to ask? Is it the chief nurse? Is it your health organisation? Is it your local uh, political member? Uh, who do you need to keep knocking on those doors and asking those questions? Because I think that's what being entrepreneurial is about, is about finding those gaps and learning how to use your voice. I think Tony talked today a lot about um, you know, some of the mechanisms that chief nurses or other organisations will have to ask for those voices, uh, as Anita raised earlier as well, about how do you get nurses' voices into kind of political conversations. And it's great to see that more and more nurses are being asked, but we also then need to make sure that we've got those skills and that confidence to, to make uh, a statement and, and work out how to do it politically and strategically, where having an association would help because we can do it as a body. Yeah, so is it watch this space, um, Kasha? Yeah, I think watch this space yeah. is uh, precisely uh, it. We've got, a, we've got a, um, a question from the audience here at Wollongong or a comment. Yes. Well, thanks, Vicky. Uh, hi, Kasha, John here. Um, I just want a fantastic work <laughs> that you're doing with Nikki and your team there at Canberra. And, um, you know, the patient needs round in the residential age care is just fantastic. I'm just curious, with the work that you're doing, I, mean, I, I, I did a review on end of life care from international evidence as part of my um, policy work with the Australian College of Nursing. And what we found is like all of these services provided to residential aged care are externally resourced. So I just wonder how far are we to be a self-sustaining workforce in aged care in terms of providing end of life or palliative care with the work that you're doing and you know the fantastic work that you're doing at Canberra. Uh, that's a very big question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, I, I think, um, and a couple of the other questions are kind of in similar things about, you know, currently the aged care labour workforce is quite fluid. What's being done to retain nurses to remain in aged care? I, I don't think we can ever presume that aged care is going to be its own unique sector. The funding comes cross-sectionally. The patients, the residents move cross-sectionally. The nurse practitioners in aged care uh, in the ACT have often actually been funded by the public service because actually it's in their interest because it's preventing hospitalisation. So the cost saving component is at the acute level. Um, so I, I think that's where 
we can make the most of those levers, make the most of those opportunities of seeing that it's not going to be necessarily within an organisation. And, and I think we just have to recognise that and make the most of it. I mean, to be honest, um, one of my primary lines is that, you know, the aged care sector, there's no other sector that you wouldn't assume that increasing qualifications would increase output, increase performance. And yet we had to argue over and over again about trying to increase level of qualifications, more registered nurses in aged care and actual recognition and registration potentially for AINs to try and improve performance. And similarly, if we wanted to reward performance in any other sector, that would be done in salary. And yet we've had 20 different reviews in the last 10 years and lasting with the Royal Commission to try and argue for improved salaries. So but in light of that, and now we're talking about how are we going to fund an increase in wages that more and more the Commonwealth or the opposition are looking to fund, this is a market-driven sector where we're subsidising something that's meant to be a free market. So we're not looking to be working in isolation in aged care. We're... Yeah, <laughs> I, do you know I'm going to um Kasia suggested that if we had a, a few moments we share the gerontological nursing competencies with you so I am going to do that if you don't mind um so this is our um sort of flagship work we're doing at the minute it's so this is our website for the adhere group and then we've got our topics here that is all the different research projects that we're undertaking. So this is our gerontological nursing competencies. I shared this with you. And what we're doing is we're working with new grads and also the existing workforce to enable them to develop competence around these 11 core competencies. So and you'll see that, um, you know, providing optimal pain management is there and also providing palliative care, as well as the other nine core competencies. So at the end of the program that we're um, delivering, the aged care nurses will be competent in these 11 areas. So we will have some, um, be able to be confident that there's a minimum skill, minimum knowledge amongst the registered nurses who complete our program. So we're going to assume that they've learned what they've learned in their undergraduate degrees, or they've got they've learned through their past experience but we'll be providing opportunities for them to excel in these areas so we are hoping that this does address that um, continuing issue of um out you know relying on external sources for within the workforce now it looks like um kasha might be back so and if any um friends on the zoom are interested in learning more about the gerontological nursing competencies they can just email us at our adhere email address or our GNC's email address. And if you are um, also interested, you can register your interest to have an expression of interest to join the program. And I'll put that in the, the chat for the Zoom friends and friends in the room. We've got bookmarks. We've got our marketing collateral, of course, you know, this special one for the competencies project. So it looks to me like Kasha might have rejoined us. Sorry about that. The joys of working from home. <laughs> I just shared the competencies project, Kasha, as my um, suggestion to address the strategy, you know, the problem of outsourcing um, expertise that we're building expertise within the aged care workforce. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I noticed in the questions as well that there was a request for Marcus to talk more about his false prevention research. Yes. There we go. I'll hand over to Marcus to share some of his research with us. Um, so currently the research that I'm working on. So in my PhD, um, I have developed an instrument um, to measure the concern of carers uh, with regards to the risk of falling among older people. So basically, the gist is I wanted to find out if the carer's um, uh, assessment of their family members' risk of falling is accurate or not. And um, and currently I'm running another study, which is a follow, follow up from my PhD study, which is to find out what is the perceptions of false and false risk among older people and carers and whether they've 
whether there is any difference um, between both uh, groups of people. And I'm also collaborating with a couple of other false research um, uh, to explore the perception and um, nurses' perceptions of false prevention and their knowledge. Um, yeah, that's roughly it. Uh, yeah, and also false prevention in the mental health uh, unit. So a few different falls from different areas. <laughs> it's very diverse, Marcus, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, will um, those of us who are interested to find out more be able to um, look you up on Google Scholar or somewhere to share or your ECU webpage to see your publications? Uh, yes, um, if you're interested in um, false perception and false risk perception, you can look up at my profile. Uh, you should be able to find a few publications. Um, there are quite a few projects that are still in progress. So hopefully I can come up with something new in the next few years. <laughs> okay, well, we better follow you on LinkedIn, following uh, Thanks, Pamela's Twitter. advice. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter because um, I'm also quite active on Twitter. Oh, there we go. Vicky, if you wouldn't so mind. Let's... Can I just jump in about false prevention? We've actually got a paper under consideration that's demonstrated that falls, lower risk of falls is associated with higher RN staffing after hours. So I, I always think it's important to make sure we've got good income input and output data about how we affect adverse events. Fantastic to hear about your prevention strategies, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. And Cash's work around um, the um the role of the registered nurse improve, increasing the number of registered nurses and looking at outcomes for the older person is um, pretty groundbreaking as well we're aware of the work that's done in the acute sector and we had um, in our school we had presentations about that last year but Kasia and her team are actually looking at that for the uh, residential aged care sector as well so we need to look out for that that's good so um, we're sort of back on track with the timing. So any other questions from the Wollongong audience here? There we go. Well, I, I might um, introduce Lauren and pass on to, we're going down the south coast of New South Wales now. So now I have to just excuse me. I'm going to read Lauren's uh, bio, biography and um, I've known Lauren <laughs> since I came to Australia in 2006 and I was fortunate um, with being awarded uh, partnership grants from the old um, health and behavioral sciences faculty in them days and I went on when I first arrived I went around all the um, hospitals, different residential aged care places. And I would say, who's your star RN? Who's your star RN? And Lauren was one of the, she's our star RN. So I met Lauren at Shell Harbour Hospital, working in the medical ward there and um, watched her um, flourish over the years and expand her career and make just wonderful contributions to gerontological nursing. So you can imagine it's very special for me to be introducing Lauren today. Now I'll read out her formal bio. So Lauren Stewart is a nurse practitioner for older people and has worked in the aged care industry for over 20 years in residential care, community care and the acute care system in metropolitan and rural areas. Lauren has a master's degree in gerontology and re rehabilitation studies from the University of Wollongong and her master of nursing nurse practitioner from the University of Newcastle. See, we're two twin universities producing great gerontological nurses, aren't we? Lauren has been involved in many research projects, including looking at the impact of the physical environment on physical activity levels in residential aged care, reducing the use of antipsychotics in dementia care and the use of delirium screening in emergency departments. Lauren was the architect of the senior outreach service in the rural areas, in a rural area where the service was tested with more than 600 residents in residential care and other vulnerable older people faced the direct threat of bushfire. Lauren was recently joined, recently joined IRT as a care manager and will be, continue to be a strong advocate for older people. So please join me in welcoming Lauren. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, happy International Nurses Day, everybody. It's a very exciting day on the nursing um just in general in the year um, and first of all just to start I wanted to acknowledge um, I'm actually sitting in Ewan country um, so um, hopefully that's worth sharing my screen yep perfect okay um, yeah so I'm sitting in Ewan country um, and it's really exciting to be here today and to focus on aged care um, and aged care nursing. Obviously, it's a passion of mine and it's really the only area of nursing that I've ever worked in. Even if I was rostered on to a shift in the emergency department, I always ended up um, looking after an older person. Um, I was obviously drawn to that area. I'm currently, as um, Victoria said, I'm currently the care manager at IRT Dalmini. Um, and for those that don't know, Dalmini is a very small um, town on the far south coast of New South Wales. Um, it's very close to Naruma and it's about five hours from Sydney and three hours from the University of Wollongong. It is a tourist town um, and a lot of people come here during tourist, um, you know, summer season. So and often people from Canberra will, will be influx with people from other areas and you can see it there so anyone thinking of wanting to visit or wanting to come and join me down um, on the beautiful far south coast if you'd like to come and work down here come and see me um, it so we can do lots of beautiful things here in you know diving fishing and swimming and I'll show you some um, images that I've got um, and very recently um, it has become infamously known for a town where many uh, multi-millionaires have bought properties, including Jerry Harvey and Justin Hems. We now have four pubs and restaurants that are run by the Maryvale Group. Um, and I'm, not, I'm telling you this for a reason, and that reason will become evident as we, as we go on. Um, so the area is classed as a rural um, area and a rural, has rural health care. The closest hospital to um, the facility is about 45 minutes away. And in reality, anybody that's unwell gets transferred to Canberra Hospital, which is three hours away. Um, so not only is um, the Aged Care Royal Commission very relevant, you know, I was obviously, like everyone watching, very um, with a lot of interest, but also um, the uh, Royal Commission in regards to rural health care, because a lot of those issues um, that were discussed affect our older people in the in the community. And the area that um, this Yurubadala coast is actually has one of the highest populations of older people um, in New South Wales, um, which means that we need to think, I guess, think about that. Um, Dalmini IRT is only a smallish facility. It's only 70 beds and it's about, as I said, 45 minutes away from um, the, ho um, the local hospital. And as I was preparing my speech and thinking about what I could talk about, um, I actually came to the conclusion that I'm not going to talk about anything fancy and I haven't done any recent research. Um, and unfortunately, that's because of children and life and all those things. Um, but what I actually want to talk about is how you can have a fantastic career in aged care and some of the challenges and some of the joys and laughter that it may bring you along the way. Um, and thinking about my own career, I was trying to sort of work out, you know, where it all came from. Um, and I also was thinking, well, how can I sort of try and describe my fantastic clinical skills and uh, my knowledge? How can I convey that to the audience? And then I actually thought, you know what, I need to go back to the art of nursing and think about that. And also mostly in, think about the why, why I chose to be a nurse that, that helps support older people. For me, the why starts when I was little. Um, I grew up in Naruma, so exactly, I've ended up exactly where I grew up. Um, and a large amount of my youth was spent with my grandparents. I was very blessed to have both sets of grandparents. And I spent a lot of time with one, um, my paternal grandmother. Um, and on the weekends, I would pretty much stay there every weekend. And we would actually come to the local nursing home and volunteer. And in those days, volunteers would hand out the tea and coffee and 
um, take people for walks and was obviously a very different time. The other piece of the puzzle, I suppose, is that my family is actually Dutch. Um, and so older people, um, as you can tell in the research as well, but older people in the Netherlands are very much respected and their whole society has a different value on the older person. So those things definitely influenced me. Um, and I remember going into the local nursing home with my Alma and very much enjoying my time there and feeling very, very valued and learning so much because these people that I was talking with had such wonderful adventures and such wonderful lives. Um, and I remember this time very fondly. And funnily enough, the nursing home that I'm currently managing is that same nursing home that I came into as a child. Um, and my grandmother is actually now a resident here of the nursing home. So I've kind of gone full circle. But that time in my youth made me want to spend time with older people. And I know some of the other speakers were talking about that personality for working in aged care or that drive that and I think that often it's about either childhood or how society values an older person. I did always want to become a nurse however I never ever thought I um, would be a nurse in aged care like everybody I wanted to be a midwife that was what I thought I wanted to, to do um, however my um, uh, I did my um, undergraduate degree at the University of Wollongong and I spent some time in the maternity ward and hated it and every time I would want to go back and spend time with older people so I knew that that was really what I wanted to do. Um, after graduating I actually took a position as with a new graduate program with an aged care facility and that was very much unheard of and I think that's something else that as aged care nurses we need to be proud of Often there's ageism in nursing that people, and this happened to me, people said to me, oh, you've got a new graduate program. You didn't do very well in your marks. Is that why you've chosen to go into that area? And actually um, it was the opposite because that was my passion and that's what I really wanted to do. And that still happens, I'm sure, for some of you working in, in the area of aged care. People will often think it's less value or less sexy than an emergency department nurse or a nurse working in a theatre. Um, after some time um, working at this nursing home, I did actually venture out into health and that's where I was working in the medical ward. Um, and of course, every, every patient that was in the medical ward was an older person anyway. Um, so I was still very happy and satisfied, but I looked at some um, changes and was able to work with some great mentors um, and that gave me the opportunity to actually think about what it was that I really wanted long term to do with my nursing career. And for the first time, I actually thought maybe I can actually have a career in aged care. And I know that um, talking to other aged care nurses, they will often say to me, oh, that role doesn't exist. And I think that's the thing in aged care nursing, like we were just hearing, you do need to knock on doors, you do need to be in creative and inventive and, and give people options and choices. Um, and I think that's definitely what um, I've been able to do. And I've been lucky to have those mentors that have meant that I've been able to do that and had the confidence to do that. I did spend some time doing some research and that was really interesting. However, once I learnt um, what a nurse practitioner was, I was then very driven uh, to become an aged care nurse practitioner. I'd never met an aged care nurse practitioner and I'd never even heard of an aged care nurse practitioner. But because I had some fantastic mentors, they all said to me, that doesn't matter. It will, you know, if you build it, it will come. And that's what happened. I was lucky enough to get a position uh, with a large nursing home just south of Sydney called Garawara. And that's where I became um, an, an authorised nurse practitioner in aged care. I was... Um, at that point, I loved, absolutely loved that role. Um, and I was given plenty of opportunities to be involved in research and um, plenty of learning opportunities, being able to link in with geriatricians and that sort of thing. Uh, but unfortunately, my family was growing and I wanted to be closer to my mum and mum and dad um, for free babysitting. Um, so I decided to move um, 
home so that they could support me with that. I was given an opportunity with IRT to work as a nurse practitioner. It was a pilot study. Um, and unfortunately, because of the Medicare rebate of nurse practitioners through Medicare, um, it wasn't a viable position and at that time. Um, so I then was having conversations with health and the benefits of a nurse practitioner and a position was created where I was able to create uh, the senior outreach service, which meant that my role was based at the hospital through the whole of the Yorubadala, going to nursing homes to prevent admissions into emergency department um, and also just older people in the community as well. The service was very well used and very busy, but it was me and a lot of that time was spent on the road. And that's one of the challenges of working in a rural area is that you're wasting a lot of time traveling. Uh, and that means that impacts on that time with a patient. I think um, I was in that role for, for several years. And as um, was alluded to in the introduction, when the bushfires were here locally, uh, we actually had to move residents from nursing homes out of harm's way. And that was a very big you know, effort that needed that coordination and also that clinical skills to know which residents could potentially go to which other nursing homes or which ones needed to go into the acute care system. That was obviously a very challenging time. And then, um, um, but it, it gave a really good insight into the, the use of a nurse practitioner because I'll, at that time, some of our GPs were stuck out of the area. So that meant that I was able to support some local GPs um, to support their residents as well. One of the other benefits or challenges of working as a nurse practitioner in a rural area is when I first arrived here, none of the medical practitioners knew what a nurse practitioner was. So I had to spend a lot of time explaining, exploring, meeting for coffee, reassuring them that I wasn't going to take their patients and I was going to work with them. But that was really beneficial because it means even now that I've got really good relationships with those GPs and they understand um, how I work. Um, and that's been a very beneficial um, relationship building. I did decide, however, at the end of last year that I um, would change from health and an opportunity came up with IRT. And there was a lot of um, changes being made in our local health infrastructure. And um, for whatever reason, I guess the older person was not necessarily going to be the central um, consideration. And for me, that's really important. So I made the change to, to join IRT as a care manager, a very different role, but I'd also been after hearing a lot of what was happening in the Royal Commission, I thought I really need to get back into residential care and really see if I can make a difference in that area. I'm sure like all of you, um, there's lots of challenges in your role. Here at the moment, we've got big staffing issues. Um, and part of that is because of our recent millionaires. They've come in and bought lots of properties. And so therefore our properties have gone through the roof which has also meant how our rent is very, very expensive. So a lot of our care workers who have been local and have worked in this facility for a long time have had to leave because they cannot afford the rent. So we are IRT and now, and as part of my role as a care manager, um, we're looking at turning um, some of the, low, the units into um, accommodation. Um, and so that will also incorporate, be incorporated into the roles as the care manager. So I guess for all of us, um, our role in aged care is often wide and varied and our everyday looks very different from the day before. And for me, that's what I love about aged care. It's that variety. But most importantly, it's, it's about spending time with those residents, you know, being able to have those conversations, the life lessons that I have been taught over an everyday, you know, lessons about marriage advice and children's advice and all sorts of things that I have had the privilege of, of being, you know, informed and having those discussions with people. So I guess it would be great um, for me that the benefits of working in aged care are, are, are huge and, and varied and that has really made me very passionate about the area. And at the moment, 
Um, you know, it's just getting my head around the role as a care manager. Um, but I think for all of us, we're all here for the same reason. And that's really exciting for me. We're all passionate about working with older people. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't even show you the pictures of Naruma. Oh. Quick. Oh. And please, um, Lauren, please take the, yeah, there oh. we go. Oh. <laughs> you and Marcus competing with the scenery. Oh, no, yeah. it's, although now I've told you that the rent's expensive, so you won't come here, but please do. Seal's just on the rocks all the time. You can go for a surf, not that I do, but yeah. And then you can swim with the seals. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you can see the chat with you being on the Zoom. Um, an old friend, Wendy, sent you a message. So we are able to um, have a virtual reunion with this Zoom. It's good. Oh, there's Mary as well. Um, Mary, do you have a question for Lauren or is it a comment here let's have a look so over to questions for Lauren one of the questions that we got um before this today and was um in the chat or the Q&A was about ageism in nursing and um when when Lauren was there and there was um another colleague Debbie who worked in asset the aged care team in the emergency department do you remember doing the panel Lauren and what we did was we did a panel of registered nurses who were working clinically in aged care for in the aged care subject to promote um, gerontological nursing to the whole cohort. Um, because even though the cohort are doing an aged care nursing subject, not all of them will see the benefit of it. So there are different strategies you can do. But now, Lauren, you're going to have to find younger ones now that you're one of the older ones. <laughs> Okay, um, Vicky, there's so quite somebody, a few questions. Yeah. yeah, have there been discussions yes. around that impact of the Royal Commission care minutes, particularly RN minutes? And another question from Mary about where are we going to find them? Lauren, do you want to talk about that, about what you think? I can tell you my what I think. Um, look, it, in a rural area, it's extremely challenging. A lot of our, um, I, the reality is that I think aged care is just going to have to pay equivalent wages to health. I guess that's going to be the first thing because I think people are wanting to work in aged care, uh, but the remuneration and I've had, um, you know, I left health um, on less money, um, but I'm closer to home. So it was, a, for me, it was a sort of a decision that I made, um, but that's ridiculous that, um, that that is how it is and that's how it was when I started 20 years ago so nothing has changed and for as we all know for aged care registered nurses you need more skills you need more assessment skills um, you know to 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 work out or to assess that deteriorating resident uh, I think that um, hopefully that if that is um, addressed then perhaps people will move over because um, some of my colleagues, obviously, I've got, you know, networks and I'm trying to attract people from to leave health and to come over. Um, and I guess I think, you know, with the work um, that Victoria is doing in really addressing that it is a specialty area and there is competencies that are required, I think that's definitely, you know, part of the solution. Um, and, yeah, I'd love to hear some great ideas because I don't know I guess in the long run if we're sending less people to the emergency department we'll need less emergency department people <laughs> nurses that would be my my ultimate aim I suppose and goal yeah I think that was a great got... answer Lauren thank you Thanks, Kasia. we might have time for one last question for Lauren I might, I might share an inspiring story that um, we got told yesterday, Kelly, Peter and some other colleagues were at lunch with RSL Life and they're going to adjust their enterprise bargain agreement so that colleagues 
who get their graduate certificate will get a pay increment similar to health. So, and I haven't heard any other aged care organization doing that. So that's, and they were saying that's within their power to do that. They can go outside the award and they can offer their team members an increment if they get a, a graduate certificate the same way that RNs in health do. So, so yes, yeah, so lots of inspiring stories to keep the hope alive for gerontological nursing. So just join me in thanking Lauren again, please. So um, welcome to our Vice Chancellor and Pre President of the University of Wollongong, Professor Trish Davidson. Um, thank you. Um, so the Zoom can't hear. So um, Professor Davidson's just wishing us all happy International Nurses Day. So the next um, part of our presentation is um, to award the scholarship that um, pa Pamela Jane Knight talked about earlier. So um, I'll leave it up to you, Trish. The certificate is here. If you'd like to come up here and announce the um, recipient of the scholarship, the recipient will come and accept their award. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Trainer, and, and it's great to see everybody. And our new uh, head of school, Yana Salomon. Yana has all the dirt on me. So, um, in fact, we spent many years working together, and um, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. So, whenever we would be writing papers and it would get to the discussion section, you say, That's yours, Trish. <laughs> That's the BS. <laughs> so, which I excel in, I excel in, so hence why I'm a vice chancellor. So, um, I'm so excited about this award. Um, firstly, um, to recognise Pamela and I, the fact that she uh, recognised the University of Wollongong and in particular recognised um, from her experiences some of the unique challenges that, you know, we all face, um, particularly women. And I look back to it, how I did um, much of my degree. And sometimes I actually think about, you know, coming here to campus after working night shift and, you know, all of those things. So we, you know, to advance our careers, um, we do some pretty amazing things. And it's, so it's my great pleasure um, to, work in, to award the inaugural Pamela Jane Knight Working Nurse Scholarship to Alera Bowden. So I wasn't quite 100% ready there, but I'm, I'll be ready in a moment. I'm going to keep you back. I'm going to keep you back tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you very much. And can I disrupt proceedings and maybe ask Alara, can you tell everybody a little bit about your story, your working nurse story? Oh, is, yeah. I don't know a nurse who is not a working nurse, but um, <laughs> please share your story. Is that right? Yes, of course. I just can't get, um, I'd like a mirror on the screen, oh. so I'm just going to send a message to the team. Okay, please. I want to say my voice is enough, but that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Some of you do already know me in the room. Um, I always talk about how nursing chose me. I didn't choose it. I was um, straight out of school into university. Didn't get the degree I was looking for, but um, it was almost meant to be. I um, started in nursing and uh, uh, saw the partnership between nursing and myself and just loved it and continued. Um, my new grad was in emergency nursing, so straight out of university as a 20-year-old uh, into emergency. So it was uh, uh, definitely um, baptism by fire. And then I moved from that emergency department to Liverpool emergency department, where I really developed um, a passion for that connection with our patients and anybody that's worked in critical care or emergency will know how hard that is to establish quickly when people are unwell and in crisis. And um, I saw time and time and time again how that was challenged by people and how that determined their journey, not just from we're competent with our knowledge and our skills, 
but our connections. So that led me to take on a whole hospital nurse educator role in aged care and uh, led to my PhD. And my PhD is looking at um, how we connect with older people through, in my case, it was empathy is what attracted me, but also as an educator, I wanted to find meaningful education for my nurses. Um, and it was uh, using aging simulation and aging simulation suits for them to experience what it feels like just a little bit to be an older person for a few minutes. And everybody's experience was different and they came out with different things, but what they came out with a different connection with their older people. When they went back to their wards and their ward environments and I followed up with them, they talked about how they felt they were doing a better job because they could connect with that individual person. And so for me, as a nurse researcher, that is challenged um, by um, the balance between clinical and research. That's the passion and the drive for research for me, is that change to clinical practice in our profession. Thank you. I'm just gonna, Alira, and we're going to ask Pam just to say hello to you. Oh, oh, oh Pam, I didn't know Pam was there. Yeah. Um, Pam, would you like to come back on screen and just um, say a hello to Alira? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm very happy to. Alira, I couldn't be prouder of your work. I was fortunate enough to have read uh, part of the application, and uh, I was very impressed. Um, I can't believe you're not 80 years old. You've accomplished so much. <laughs> Well, I feel it. No. <laughs> um, well, I wanted to. Go ahead. Sorry, keep going. I said you're an amazing nurse. You're um, a prolific presenter. You uh, are very interested in areas that I'm very interested in because much of what your uh, interest in delirium is actually neuro. Um, you know, it's. Uh, and I actually did a talk a long, long time ago on delirium to the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses when it wasn't a very popular topic. And now it's on everybody's lips. And I'm so happy to see that you're researching it and you're out there promoting how important it is not to just think this is one more crazy lady, that there may be a basis to the problem. Congratulations. Thank you. I think it's important before I sit down because I could talk all day, but it's not just about me and I need to acknowledge the research community I sit within, especially the delirium community, Pamela. I work um, alongside some brilliant colleagues and I'm only just a small part of that. So thank you to my supervision team, the other nurses I work with, the other colleagues. We're all working together um, for a better, different nursing uh, profession. So thank you. Happy International Nurses Day. <laughs> Thank you, Alira. Thanks, Trish, for being here to uh, personally award the inaugural Pamela Jane Nye Scholarship. And thank you so much, Pamela. And thank you for um, staying with us for the duration of the session. So just one last round of applause. <laughs> so, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Trish now, our uh, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Wollongong, who's going to do the closing address for International Nurses Day celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank So um, thank you so much, uh, Vicky, to um, allow me just to make some comments on International Nurses Day. Um, I had the pleasure of giving an address at um, lunchtime to the nurses in Orange via Zoom. I must admit, 
I sort of fumbled over the gerontological <laughs> nursing. <laughs> so I said, I promise, I, you know, I won't get it wrong. Um, but I just thought I'd just provide um, just some comments and thoughts, um, particularly on International Nurses Day, where it's so important to celebrate our profession and um, just see if this should just page down, shouldn't it? Yeah, so uh, thank you. Just a bit slower, or it's me. Um, particularly today um, on International Nurses Day. I know I've, I've, it's, that's, I've stopped touching it. Um, I think what is really important um, is particularly this year after what our profession has been through, through the last two and a half years, uh, we really need to stop, take stock, and really collectively and individually commit to demonstrating and arguing for our value proposition. Still, we remain as a cost on Excel spreadsheets with very little recognition of our value. And that's what we want to change. And I'm really particularly committed to changing the image of nursing, particularly in aged care. Um, just I'm not sure it's just okay. So I think what and I've shown this slide with so many times, but I just think if we look at COVID, there's been such a huge emphasis on innovation and technology, and we know that's right. We know we the vaccinations have been really instrumental in getting us through this pandemic, as have been a whole range of advances in other therapeutics, particularly ECMO and other therapies. But I think if we really look at the data, who has been most affected in the pandemic? It's the elderly, it's the poor, it's the alienated and the marginalized. And we have seen very graphic descriptions and actions that have even split the city of Sydney in East and West. And we know that, you know, even though there's lots of talk about sovereignty for New South Wales in terms of RNA technology, et cetera, unless we fundamentally address social determinants of health and create a robust health system and a robust public health system, which should be considered as, a, as integral to society as transportation, as public transport, we are never going to move forward. And we know that today here you're talking about aged care, but if we had a session next week in, on neonatology, the issues would be same there and the same groups at risk. Sorry, it's just being a bit clunky, or is it me? Reach down. Um, and I, I again just sort of wanted to emphasize where we're at in terms of lessons learned. Uh, these are just uh, really, again, looking at what have been the factors that have made uh, a contribution to health disparities in COVID. It's been access, it's been comorbidities, it's been age, and it's been social, economic, and political factors. And here we need to move forward to really acting in terms of, in particular, safe housing and access to care in order to make a difference to patients and their families. Sorry, it's just a bit clunky. And you'll see all over the world, I think in every country, and this is just from the National Academy of Medicine in the US, is this just commitment to health equity. And that's where we need to move forward on. Um, you know, we often in healthcare have this kind of parallel universes that we're living in. And, you know, we can go into critical care units and that's what, you know, uh, everything that moves or beeps or beats has a sensor or is tracked. But yet we know um, most of the care is, is really given in communities and it's particularly in people's homes. And this is an extreme example, but can I tell you, even in our own community, the most affected during the COVID pandemic were just a few kilometers from us 
people with mental health issues, people with drug and alcohol issues. And of course, what has happened in residential aged care settings, uh, I think our community has fared much better than others. But what has happened in aged care settings has been really um, a huge issue of human rights and a huge issue of ageism and in some many ways an abuse of our profession because people have been providing care who are presented as nurses but are not nurses and as a consequence you know I think even though we have are very excited with the um, election campaign to put nurses back into residential aged care. I always say nurses in nursing homes. Who would have thought of that? You know, a novel concept. But um, somehow still, you know, we have to take responsibility. Today, I was interviewed, where are we going to get the nurses? Well, the nurses are there and they will come if they're recognised and valued and treated appropriately. Sorry, this is just... Um, and this might not come up as well, but the previous image, um, which I don't think as we converted to PDF, actually if you, this slide, I went into Google and put aged care images and there was a lot of hand holding, a lot of arms around each other, all this warm fuzzy stuff, which is important. But the fundamental message for, and particularly for Geraldont, yeah, that word nursing, <laughs> aged care, I'll stick with aged care, is that nurses are not just kind, but they're smart. Mm -hmm. And that the work that they do is very challenging. And in particularly in aged care, it's even more challenging because of the complex physical assessment, cognitive assessment, pharmacotherapy, and the complexity of interventions. And delirium, you know, is a, is a case in point. So, Today, you know, I really would like all of you experts in aged care to also talk about your science. Talk about what the difference your research is going to make to aged care. Because I think it's very invisible what happens behind those four walls of aged care. Or what, you know, uh, Jocelyn Lawler wrote a book, you know, about you know, 40 years ago, Behind the Curtains. You know, we pull the curtains and we do all of these things, but people don't know. And aged care, because of the social, political and economic drivers, is kind of an exemplar of what we want to avoid. That the nature of nursing work has not been understood. It's been assumed that a heartbeat and a pair of feet and six weeks of a community college will suffice for a master's or doctorally prepared nurse with expertise in aged care. This is, some, this is a misconception that we really have to avoid. And more importantly, in our region, I want us to be a place where people want aged care placements. Um, at Johns Hopkins, where I was before, it was the only school of nursing I've ever worked at where people complained about an aged care placement. And even now, my friends will say, you know, my daughter hasn't had an acute care placement. They've just been in, in aged care. I'm thinking, well, what a better place to learn about physical assessment, to learn about pharmacology, to learn about so many things. So I think I would really love us collectively to change that image, to make an aged care placement that is something that is just as valued as a time in ICU. And many of us who've percepted students know that in hospitals, you know, you're always fifth or sixth behind the medical student to auscultate for breath sounds or heart sounds. You know, so in aged care with the right preceptorship and the right models of care, they can be great learning opportunities for our students. But I think it's up to us collectively to change the image that aged care is more than just hand, you know, those images. I wish this had come up, but you all have seen them. They're all there, all those hand images. To thinking about what a delirium assessment 
looks like, what an assessment for frailty looks like, what a cognitive assessment looks like, what an advanced care planning conversation is all about. So um, really today, I just really wanted to celebrate your great work. And I just, my last slide, if it comes up, is, you know, what will it take to change the image of aged care from being, you know, in some quarters perceived as the orphan or the not as glamorous or the not as popular? Well, I think we need adequate training resources and mentoring. We need funding and support. We need political will and engagement. And Victoria was part of a recently an aged care summit that we held here in the area to try and get people to think differently about it. And we have to also think about aged care across the curriculum, not just six weeks in a module. Uh, Vicky, I'm not sure if you remember, someone said to me, it's always, the trouble is, that's always, you know, it's like sitting on a plane and someone's, the trouble is with nursing. Uh, the trouble is people don't get enough aged care in the curriculum. And if you look at it, we're never going to move past because we're never going to be in nursing school long enough to get enough of everything. But thinking about aged care holistically, looking at nursing care from a life course approach, there's so many bits of our nursing education that contribute to being a good nurse in aged care. That's from physical assessment, communication, pharmacology, pathophysiology, et cetera. So my last plea is if we think about our clinical areas as a silo, we're never going to move forward. You know, I, you know, and that's what COVID has also taught us is that we can't think about things in a dichotomous modular way. You know, I grew up in cardiology and, you know, respiratory, that was a novel thought that the lungs or the kidneys or something was a, so, cause that was what you were taught about cardiology. Um, now we know that communicable and non-communicable diseases, there's a bleeding and an intersection. And more importantly, the things that we can change as a profession will largely be in the delivery of healthcare services, the quality of healthcare services, and fundamentally addressing a health equity agenda. So I just wanted today to celebrate nursing. It's been a tough few years and we are still a long way out of the woods. I think we need to put our arms around ourselves. I know from my colleagues that I talk to, they are exhausted. And, um, and we hope that we can see a way forward. But Let's kind of particularly be ready as we come out of the election, whoever wins, to make sure that we're really advocating for robust um, workforce in aged care. And sorry, Victoria, I can't say that word very well, so I'm going to say aged care. So thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Trish, for... Um, doing the closing address. Now, we haven't got time for so many questions, but we can stay around. There's still some bickies and things, but I get to do the vote of thanks since I'm the moderator. So um, I've just got um, my last slide to share. Oh, there was, the, yeah, here we go. So see how I go with the screen share, but just the, yeah, it's getting a bit, um, so getting a, the minions are getting a bit old fashioned now, aren't they? Showing my age. <laughs> but anyone who knows me knows I love the minions. So I thought the minions could say it's a thank new movie you. Coming on the 15th of June. Oh, that's made my day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a shame Isla's too old for the minions now. <laughs> oh, that's good. So I would just like to thank um, all our presenters from the opening address through to Trish doing our closing address. And thank you for everyone for taking time out of their day to join us and celebrate gerontological nursing today. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.